Here's the situation. We're going to be talking about wontons today. And wontons are a specific type of dumpling, oftentimes irregular, wrinkly, silky, delicious, and eaten in large quantities. There are, however, regional differences to wontons within China. And today we're going to look at two of the most popular types, the Northern and the Southern. The thing with wontons is when you look throughout China, you'll find different Chinese characters that roughly sound like wonton from Yuntun to Hundun, um, and also sort of like regional uh, dialect versions. It's one of those dishes that is wonderfully mistranslated, but over time has generated its own traditions. So here, very briefly, today we have a northern type and a southern type. The northern type is often eaten as a noodle. Um, I usually like to eat it for breakfast, but it's available as a snack or as a whole meal of emulsified pork in a white, usually just flour wrapper. I grew up in Hong Kong in the South, where we grew up eating wontons that are named after swallowing clouds. And that comes from these plump, juicy shrimp and pork dumplings that have a slightly different texture, usually are yellow, and they're eaten with noodles. Both types are delicious. We're going to make both of them today. Here's the first type of wonton. I'm making sweeping generalizations here, but this is a Northern Chinese style wonton. In Mandarin, we call this Hundun, and it roughly idiogrammatically translates to um, uh, uh, messy bites, uh, messy little parcels. Wontons are dumplings, and here in the United States, people tend to like to think of dumplings as appetizers or side dishes. This dish in particular, this type of wonton, is usually eaten as a main course, the way we would eat noodles or rice. The idea here is that within this parcel of meat, with the soup and all those things, you have everything that constitutes a meal. So, northern style wontons, the main thing that we're going to do today is we're going to walk through the technique of building a scallion ginger water for aromatic purposes without introducing too much oil into the recipe. And we're going to talk about emulsification of meat mixtures. That's classically northern. Pork is the main ingredient. There isn't very much else that goes into the wonton. First things first is the scallion and ginger water. We commonly see this in the stir fry activated with a little bit of oil, but this is a pretty traditional um, Northern Chinese technique of actually activating it with hot water. So here we have about a quarter cup of boiling hot water that's gonna go into this mixture of ginger and scallion, letting them sit for about 30 minutes so that those flavors infuse. The idea is if we're introducing any liquid into the dumpling, you want that liquid to be flavorful. Pork is ground. This is a pretty decent fat to lean meat ratio, but from what I've been told, the really indulgent um, Northern style wontons might have something as high as um, one part lard to two parts lean pork, which would make it 66 to 33. The core tenet of the Northern wontons filling is emulsification. Emulsification, very briefly, is the attempt to bring oil and water together. In cooking, basically, that's usually what it means. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But um, if you have a higher fat content inside of your dumpling, that gives you a little bit more um, oil and fats to work with so you can pull out those protein strands. But basically, what we're gonna season this with is salt, Sichuan peppercorn, white peppercorn, and sesame oil. We're gonna help it emulsify and bind some of those proteins, those fats and those waters with a little bit of an egg white and some cornstarch. A little bit of water to mix in with the oil that's already inside of the pork as well as inside of the sesame oil. Make sense? That's the core mixture. We're going to start bringing it all together with a classic pinching motion that they taught me in Sichuan. Um, I think this is just an easy way to bring everything together. And like many other sort of Chinese style dumpling fillings or farces, the goal here is to extend the protein strands. And the way my grandmother taught me how to do this is to constantly mix in one direction. Now, you might ask yourself, why am I only mixing in one direction? What happens if I weren't to do this, for example, or like mix in the other direction. It doesn't actually j really matter, but mixing in one direction in sh is an easy cheat code to make sure that you're getting these protein strands as long as possible. I think you can start to see it develop when you see those little strands here as I begin to mix. But if you continue mixing in one direction, you'll see that those strands get longer and longer and longer and longer. In the beginning, it might have seemed like the mixture is very wet, 
So the meat is going to gradually absorb all of that liquid and help emulsify the entire mixture. This process absolutely, in my opinion, can be done in a food processor because you're aiming for a pretty homogenous meat mixture. If you were to make a southern style wonton, for example, where you want a little bit more texture to the pork, I do not recommend doing it in the food processor. Here's how far I like to take the meat mixture. It's not entirely smooth, but there isn't any liquid on the side anymore. It's absorbed all of that. And you can see those protein strands that they're about, I'm gonna say, what is that, half an inch long, like a centimeter, a little over a centimeter long at least. And that's a good place for me, in my opinion, to stop. Now wrappers, Northern style wrappers tend to be white and tend to be a little bit smaller, or at least the type of Hwanduan that I'm making is a little bit smaller. You're aiming for a lot more dumpling skin to hang off excess because you're eating this dumpling skin almost like a noodle as your carbohydrates for the meal. The white skin means that there isn't any egg in the mixture, and this is usually what you see in those breakfast wonton shops. You could use the yellow ones too, but I like to use the yellow ones that have a little bit, those have a little bit more um, uh, bounciness, tensile strength, Q. And so I like to use that for bigger dumplings like the wonton. Universal rule for dumpling making in general, I think is a lot less filling than you think almost always less filling than you think. We're not gonna even use water on the side of this to squeeze it together because the idea is you have to make a lot of them that putting the water on is an extra step and the moisture that's already in the meat filling should help the whole dumpling come together. So really small amount. This is like a super cheap meal, tiny, tiny bit. What is this? Half a teaspoon, a little bit over half a teaspoon. We're gonna fold it like this halfway through, roll it and then just squeeze the two sides together like that. And then squeeze a little bit. And all that excess dump, all that excess on the side is gonna be flowy noodle, if that makes sense. Okay, we'll do another one. Here you go. Smallest amount of meat. You're eating 10 or 12 of these for breakfast. We don't, really don't need that much. Like half a teaspoon. Fold it over to seal it once. The meat filling itself is gonna help seal it. Go another time, and then two sides on the side. Squeeze it like this. Boop. That's one. And the goal is to make them quite quickly. The coolest way to do this is with a tiny wooden paddle that the aunties use. But the whole idea is that they're named after messy little parcels, so they're allowed to be messy. The emulsified meat mixture has enough moisture to keep the dumplings from splitting apart. So don't worry about adding that water seal on the side. Cool. If you move quickly enough, you should be able to make your way through all of this before your dumplings are entirely dried up. But if you find yourself to be a little bit slow, you want to cover this with wet paper towel to prevent the outer edges of that wonton wrapper becoming dry. With the wet paper towel, I might keep these wontons for up to uh, two days in the fridge. Um, you could alternatively also freeze them. Because they're so small, um, you can cook them from frozen really quite quickly. It's gonna take maybe a minute, a minute and a half. This is a quick and dirty way to build broth, whether you're at home or whether you're um, uh, at a small northern Chinese wonton breakfast shop. Basically, you have a bunch of aromatics that are going to go inside of the bowl and they're going to crash hot boiling stock over the top. And that's going to complete the dish. While that's happening, we're going to get our water boiling. You want a rolling boil for these dumplings. They don't have to cook very long. And to finish the cooking process, we want a bowl of room temperature to cool water. I'll explain that in a little bit. I'm gonna put some things in the bowl. The complicated stuff first, seaweed. Chinese dried seaweed, many, many different types. This one, I believe, is called laver. The way you identify it is it comes in a bing. It comes in a circular dried shape. Break off as much as you like to put into your soup. It's basically already cooked, so it just needs a little bit of hot water to warm it up. This is the vegetable, so to speak, in the meal, in the broth. It's a bit much. Do that. We're going to add a little bit of scallion, a little bit of cilantro to the bottom, dried shrimp. If you get the orange type of dried shrimp, dice it up really fine just because it's not going to get a lot of time in hot, hot water. But traditionally, it's this uh, shrimp skin or really, really baby saltwater shrimp um, called xia pi in Chinese. A little bit of soy sauce, that's most of the sodium. Pinch of white pepper and then pinch of salt just to balance out that 
soy. And we'll taste it and fix it up later. Here's a little bit of chicken broth. If you have fish broth at home, vegetable broth at home, even water plus chicken powder, um, which is probably what a lot of places use, you can use that. Hot broth, it's gonna go over. Mix it up. You see, that just rehydrates immediately. This sort of light brown color is what you're aiming for. I actually really like these wontons in a tomato egg drop soup also. Um, but this is a pretty simple one. Always check your work before you go. Good, salty, in a good way. That's pretty delicious actually. Keep that to the side. Okay, tiny wontons. I don't anticipate that they will take more than a minute, minute and a half to cook because they're so small. Let's say we're gonna cook one batch at a time, which I believe is roughly 10 to 12 dumplings. Rolling boil, all the dumplings go in at once. This will not stick to the bottom of your pot if once it comes in contact with the hot water, you move it around a little bit. As this is happening, I'm gonna explain the cold water. Starch gelatinization is the process in which starch is converted to the extent that it's basically cooked. Um, to get that sort of like bouncy texture from starch, it needs to go through a heating process, but it also needs to go through a cooling process. So one of the ways to help that cooling process to lock in what in Chinese we call Q, which is that almost um, slightly bouncy, um, slight gentle resistance to your um, to, to the bite, like a little bit of that bounciness, like a perfect dumpling skin or a perfect noodle, um, you need to cool it down really quickly. So in a lot of restaurant settings, when they're cooking a huge amount of dumplings, they like to shock it in cool water, not ice water, because you're not trying to cool down the dumpling so much. You're just trying to cool down the skin on the outside so that it finishes gelatinizing. And you'll know that that's done if the skin turns transparent. Not entirely, but a little bit. So all of this is gonna come out. Silky, if you touch it, it's firm, it's cooked. Just dunk it in cold water for 10 seconds. Finish that starch gelatinization process and help it turn silky, but not overcooked and broken. It's also a very good way to control the cook of these tiny, tiny wontons. Mix it up. Classic Northern Chinese style wontons. Honestly, a privilege to show people this because it's not just Southern Chinese style wontons, but you can see with my haphazard lack of dumpling folding skill, these dumplings are still totally intact because of that emulsification and the amount of moisture that's inside of the pork itself. With that small amount of pork, you get these beautiful um, dumplings that have a huge amount of skin, so it eats a little bit like a noodle. This is why it's a meal and not an appetizer. Perfect, okay. Nice and salty, like tastes like the sea from the seaweed. A little bit of chicken broth to balance it out. One of my favorite things about this and a lot, about a lot of like basic Chinese cooking, even in sort of regular everyday dishes like these wontons that, you, that I usually have for breakfast, is land, air, and sea. So you have that seaweed sweetness, you have a little bit of that chicken broth to tame some of those like more aggressive salt flavors, and then you obviously have the pork inside of the wonton. It's a good balance that way. <laughs> A little rude, but you could hear this. There's so much dumpling skin in there that it does eat entirely like a noodle. And it's cool because the texture of the seaweed mimics the texture of the wonton skins itself. You slurp it all down, it's a really quick meal. And honestly, if you make the dumplings ahead of time, keep them in the freezer, I think this is, uh, like, it's such a wonderful, um, uh, easy, easy, super quick meal. Good stuff. You can put chili oil on this if you like, but it's good as is, I think. Southern wontons are called wonton in Cantonese. This is the wonton you think about when you think about those Michelin recommended wonton noodle soups in Hong Kong. They're super juicy, they're really plump, um, but they're also very, very clean. This wonton recipe is significantly more complicated than the last one, if only because of the specificity of the ingredients. First, we're going to build the southern wonton broth. Wonton tong is quite a clean broth. It's 
totally clear, amber may be golden. What you're looking for is just three primary ingredients. The first is going to be pork bone, which is the basis for a lot of the texture and the viscosity of that broth. Also, some of the sweetness is gonna come from there. Second are dried shrimps. There are a couple types of dried shrimps we can use. This is a quite classic Chinese dried shrimp. You're soaking this in cold water for 15 minutes. That's a lot of the orange color and a lot of that shrimp flavor. And the third is dried flounder. It's a little bit more difficult to get in the United States. There are a lot of different types of dried flounder, but this is what we call dai dai yu in Cantonese, which translates roughly to big land fish. These are like, you know, bottom feeders that are sun-dried. We're going to toast this off, beautiful caramelized color, and this is going to be the most of the flavor of this broth. Everything that's inside of the broth needs to mimic the umami and sweet flavors of the wonton itself. Almost every ingredient that goes into the wonton is also inside of the broth, but we're aiming for a nice, clean, clear, elegant wonton salad broth. This is just like classic toasting things to make them taste more delicious. This is going to go in the broiler. In the traditional Cantonese kitchen, they would probably do this over fire, either the wok or their gas range or whatnot. Moments later. See, that oil's coming out. That means that those flavors are being activated by heat. If you don't do this process, your broth isn't going to be as golden and delicious. So just to get the other side too, we're just gonna flip it over and toast the other side. More moments later. Nice brown color. You can smell it, the fat's getting pushed out. Sugars are starting to caramelize. Little details matter, but this is a great color. See that? So much better. The other thing is you'll know that this is ready if the bones are a little bit more brittle and easy to cut through. I don't think the dried flounder market is ready for how... No, it just can't. Nobody's gonna make this recipe. Okay, just to finish dealing with the flounder, we're gonna cut it up so it fits inside of the pot. Easier to deal with, doesn't really matter. That's a piece. Maybe take out this flesh. Into cold water. We're gonna bring it up very, very gently from cold. All of this delicious stuff, all of it goes in. Pork bone. This is femur bone. Femur bone is a little bit sweeter than like um, spine bone. I, I don't know if the butchers that you're gonna go to are gonna make that or distinguish that when you buy your pork bones. But this is great for soup. It has a little bit of gelatin and collagen that's gonna give it a little bit of texture, but we're not looking for like Japanese tonkotsu. We're not looking for any emulsification. There isn't, it's not gonna be big and chunky and velvety. This is mostly for that flavor and, and that texture is gonna be really quite gentle. We're aiming for a clear broth, which means that the pork bones need to be blanched. The pork bone is gonna go into cold water, bring it up to temp. Once you get to a rolling boil, you're gonna skim off some of the scum over the top and give it a minute or two for all of that to cook, then you're gonna drain it all off and wash it rigorously, vigorously, vigorously, rigorously, both rigorously and vigorously. You're gonna wash the pork bones to get as much of that blood off as possible, otherwise you're gonna have a brown nasty broth. So this is about two small femurs, and this is just gonna go inside of the pot with the cold water. And lastly, handful of dry shrimp. This just needs to be soaked. If it's really dirty, wash it a couple of times, but don't keep that initial soaking liquid because again, there might be dirty stuff in there. You want a clear broth. Once all the ingredients are in the pot, you're gonna turn it on to bring it to a simmer. If you're really detail-oriented about this, you're looking for around 165 to 175 degrees. Actually, funny side note, Chinese chefs, when they're talking about uh, boiling water, describe the temperature of the water with metaphors. 165-ish is called a shrimp eye boil, hangan so So it's like the, the bubbles that come up are the size of shrimp eyes. 175 is what we're kind of looking for, which is a crab eye boil, because the crab's eyes are significantly, but just a little bit bigger than the shrimp eyes. So what you want to see, you're not really even looking for movement on the top of the water. You're looking for like small crab eyed style bubbles to rise to the surface. Really important, don't let this boil. If this boils, you're gonna bring out a lot of those bitter flavors, but more importantly, you're gonna muck up the texture and you're gonna get the, the broth all cloudy. We're looking for a nice amber, golden, um, brown and clear. Soon after. Take a look at this broth. See those bubbles? Those bubbles, those little tiny crab eye-sized bubbles, that's what we're looking for. 
This is probably around 175 and it's just below a simmer and this is the perfect temperature to extract maximum amount of flavor while keeping this broth nice and clean. If you were really difficult about this and you wanted to be a little bit more precise, we would try to build a clean broth by skimming off all of the scum that comes over the top. Now, most of that scum should have already been taken care of when we were blanching the pork bones and when we were roasting the fish bones. But if there is anything like this over the top and you have the patience and the wherewithal, this is what you should be doing. Just skim it off occasionally, um, just so it doesn't re-emulsify into that broth and produce a cloudier product. There are also, by the way, perfect um, fine mesh soup skimmers out there that you can get at Asian grocery stores because people are quite precise and specific about the broth in many parts of East Asia. You see those bubbles? Once, now you can really sort of start to see them. This tiny bubble size, no bigger than the tip of a Japanese chopstick. All these metaphors, I can't imagine being helpful. Um, uh, you could also obviously just use a thermometer. This is what you're looking for. Don't disturb it too much, but let me just want to make sure that you guys can see the bubbles. This is where you want to keep it around three and a half hours. The reason why I think this is one of the most representative dishes for Hong Kong cooking and Cantonese cuisine is because it is so elegant, it is so clean, and it doubles down on the ingredients that are inside of the, both the wonton and the noodle. When we're eating this dish, one thing to note is the northern style wontons, you have wontons that are eaten almost as noodles, as a carbohydrate. This wonton noodle soup has both wontons and noodles. For that reason, because there is a little bit of this starch from the noodle, there is a larger filling to skin ratio for this other style of wontons. We're going to season it with a lot of the same stuff that goes inside of the broth, and a lot of the things that are inside the noodle itself are also in the wonton skin. So you'll start to see these ingredients come back and layer over each other over and over again. That's why it's so elegant. That's why it's so, so, so wonderful. Hong Kong still is one of the best places for wonton noodles. I don't think there are other places in China that come close, um, but this is by no means, I must iterate this, this is not like the perfect version, this is not the definitive version. This is the type of stuff that shokunin, or that's a Japanese word for um, like real masters of their craft, spend years mastering. This is just a little bit of a demonstration or an approach towards something that I find acceptable made at home. Okay, three primary protein flavors. First is the shrimp, second is the pork, third is the dried flounder. Shrimp comes oftentimes when we buy shrimp, especially if it's peeled, deveined, um, it oftentimes is frozen, and it's important to wash off all of that muck. In a regular Cantonese kitchen, what will happen is they put a bowl of the peeled shrimp um, underneath the tap, and then they'll plug the tap a little until an aggressive amount of water comes out, and it's called bae so you're just sort of um, attacking the shrimp with water. The idea is like the aggressive motion of the water will purge a lot of the non, um, a lot of the uh, nasty stuff outside out of the shrimp. You're also replacing all the shrimp liquid that can be stinky, for example, with clean water. That gives it a nicer texture, and it also actually, if you wash it well enough, um, it'll turn the shrimp pink. That said, at a home, in a home sort of um, context, I think it's quite wasteful to um, spend that much water um, to, to wash your shrimp. So I suggest rinsing it off at least two or three times. And you see that, you'll see that after you wash it, it does turn a little bit pink too. So you're just trying to get rid of some of that nasty shrimp water. And once that's done, you're gonna keep it in ice water to shock it, to keep the texture nice and tight. This is really important. Um, if you have nice fresh shrimp, this is my preferred method of protecting the, 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 the bounciness and the Q texture of that shrimp. If you don't have super, super fresh shrimp, what many people end up doing is they add baking soda, which also helps, but sometimes gives it a little bit too much of that baking soda flavor. So we're just gonna let that shrimp chill in there. Onto the pork. So here's ground pork mixture. We're going to add a couple of seasonings in here. Dried flounder powder, better if you make it on your own, but you can buy this online also. White pepper for a little bit of that floral, almost citrusy pepper flavor for balance. Some sesame powder for nuttiness. Here is shrimp roe. So this is all the roe off of the shrimp that is then sun-dried. This is so, so important to the, the flavor of the broth and the flavor of the dumpling. Um, interestingly enough, this shrimp roe with 
the, well, traditionally it's duck eggs, but these days it's mostly chicken eggs, are both the flavorants for the noodle itself. So again, the stuff that's inside of the wonton is the stuff that's inside of the noodles. Eggs gonna go in. A little bit of sesame oil, double down that nuttiness. Here is a little bit of soy sauce for seasoning. Now keep in mind the dried flounder powder is already a little salty. And then here's a bit of the cornstarch, just to help that egg emulsify. Unlike the northern style wonton, we're not aiming for emulsification here. We just want to bring everything together and want to maintain the integrity of the texture of the pork. So we're going to use a pinching motion. We're gonna go in, mix everything up, and we're just gonna sort of squeeze like this. You can be a little bit aggressive about it. I think a lot of us were taught through Western cooking systems not to destroy the texture of the meat or to slap it around and move it. But squeezing is a really easy physical way to get flavor or get marinades into meat. And Cantonese cooking certainly isn't allergic to that. There's gonna be a little bit of texture here from that shrimp roe. There's gonna be a little bit of texture from that ground sesame seeds. But all that is to add sort of a nice nutty background to the pork itself. We're just gonna do this for probably about three, four, five minutes. I'm not trying to mix it, as you can tell. I'm just pinching it to bring everything to, together and then massaging the meat so that the flavors will infuse. I do not suggest doing this in a food processor because I think you'll ruin the texture of the meat. I like the Cantonese wontons a little bit more loose. And actually, if you really wanted to take the time to do this, um, well, one other thing you can do is you can mince your own pork. As you can tell, there's less liquid in this compared to the northern wonton, so it's not as gloopy, and there certainly isn't any liquid on the bottom. But you can tell it like sticks together closer to what an American meatloaf, uh, maybe even meatball would, would look like. All that's combined together, that is the pork component. Turns out the shrimp was way too big and it doesn't fit the size of wrappers that we want. And you want the whole piece of shrimp in there, right? It's not a minced shrimp inside of the mixture. Um, so we've cut it in half so that it fits inside these cute tiny wrappers. Shrimp's gonna go in the middle. A little more than half a tablespoon worth of filling, almost roughly one-to-one -to, -one to the shrimp in terms of volume. This is gonna come up over the top. You're just gonna close it, seal it like this. And then the other sides are gonna come for what's called in Hong Kong, a fishtail shape. So we're squeezing right where the filling of the wonton meets the skin. We're gonna squeeze to seal it, but not too hard because you want the flaps to still swim along the sides. That's where the goldfish comes from. Like that's a goldfish shape, if that makes sense. These, honestly, these, um, this dumpling here is a little bit uh, smaller than the super traditional Hong Kong ones because of the wrapper size, but we will allow it. Honestly, my favorite types of Southern wontons, Cantonese dumplings, Cantonese wontons, wonton, are almost a uh, ping pong ball sized, which means that you need a much, much larger wrapper. A little bit of pork. Seal just a corner, the rest come in. Squeeze where the farce meets the skin, enough to seal it. And that's a wonton. Slightly higher filling to skin ratio compared to the northern one. Here you go again, corner. Come back up, squeeze. These wrappers here are yellow because they're supposed to contain eggs. They're traditionally made with duck egg yolks. However, um, it seems like we've lost that tradition to modernity, which is to say that these wrappers in particular, looking at the ingredients, don't actually contain any eggs. And it's yellow food coloring. It's kind of a bummer, but that does make them, nope, that does not make them vegan because they're stuffed with pork and shrimp. <laughs> But anyway, they all look like little goldfish. They have little tails. Center is sealed with that um, meat farce um, with the shrimp on the bottom. That's what you want. 
If you'd like to prep them ahead of time, you could freeze them. I don't love freezing this because if your shrimp's already been frozen, um, freezing it again just means you're defrosting and freezing it again, which isn't the best thing for the seafood. But you can prep these ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna say because there's a shrimp in there, one day in the fridge with a wet paper towel over it um, or in the freezer for however long you'd like to keep it. One other tip if you're freezing dumplings, um, including wontons, is you want to freeze it on a flat sheet pan. That way um, the shape will set and then transfer it into a bag. Don't throw this all into a bag or a container and have it pile all over each other before you throw it in the freezer. Three and a half hours later, the broth has done most of the heavy lifting for extracting the primary flavors from the flounder, the pork bone, and the shrimp. We're gonna give it a little bit of a vegetal note with mung bean sprouts. The reason why we use mung bean sprouts is because number one, when they're cooked, they're naturally quite sweet. They also have this like nice sort of um, almost herbaceous, but um, a little grassy um, uh, vegetal flavor. And because there's no onions or ginger or garlic or anything in this broth, this is a very subtle way to introduce some of those like rounding earth notes. So we're gonna bring the broth up to a simmer where it is now and the bean sprouts are gonna go in, submerge them, let them cook for around 20 minutes, just to extract all of that flavor out of there. Many big bags later. After 20 minutes or so, the bean sprouts are cooked. We're gonna turn it off and then we're gonna strain this. Because we want to try to get it as clear as possible, we're gonna strain it gently through the cheesecloth and the sieve. Now there are other things that people actually sneak into wonton broths too. Chicken bone is very popular as a delicate um, uh, meat flavor that has a little bit of structure. Um, uh, a lot of times people use fried shrimp shells um, or like stir fried shrimp shell that are toasted. That will give it even more shrimp flavor, which makes a lot of sense. Some people also use uh, fresh fish bones. Um, but the problem with a fresh fish bone sometimes is that there's a lot of collagen in there, so it might sometimes cloud your broth, um, which is not what you want. That'll do for now. So here's the broth. <clears throat> Once it's off the heat and everything's been strained out, we're gonna season it with three things, salt, rock sugar, and MSG. Rock sugar for sweetness, but also to balance that salt flavor. Salt is primarily what's going to coax out most of the delicious flounder, pork, and shrimp flavor from here. So a decent amount of salt. When we're thinking of seasoning this wonton broth, we're thinking of, we're thinking of it the way you might think of seasoning a um, broth for Japanese ramen. Is that helpful for people to know? A lot of noodle shops in Japan and in uh, China have broths going on the stove the whole time. Because that broth is going on and it's slowly simmering, it's gonna keep reducing and then chefs will add water to it throughout the day. And so the, the salinity of that stock is actually quite hard to maintain. As a result, most of the time, your noodles are actually seasoned in the bowl itself and not in the broth. So here we're just giving it a little bit of salt, sugar, and MSG to coax out some of those flavors, but know that the salinity is going to be controlled at the end in the bowl itself. MSG for umami. We're just stirring it to make sure that rock sugar is, is dissolved. I think it's gonna need a little bit more salt. But this broth is not gonna taste like very much without a little bit of salt, sugar, and MSG. It's gonna help bring out all those flavors. Okay, quick taste. Super hot. Salt. Good stuff. Whoa, cool. Magic of salt is that once you add the right amount, everything else tastes more like itself. We're not, again, not aiming for salinity of the broth itself, we're just trying to coax out the other flavors. This is very good. These noodles here, these are oftentimes here in English called wonton noodles, but in Hong Kong, traditionally, they would have been called jok seng min, which uh, translates to like bamboo rising, bamboo bouncing, 
noodle. And the reason for that is because these noodles have a little bit of bounce to them. The bounce comes from number one, an alkaline, like alkaline water. Um, these days, some people use baking soda, similar to how ramen noodles have a little bit of that bounce, um, but less elastic. And the way it was kneaded was with a long bamboo pole. And the person would put one leg over the bamboo and then massage it that way. Really, really traditional way of doing it. Most places do it by machine now. Um, but that's why it's back in the day would have called chok seng mi, bamboo noodles. Just a small portion. Cook it according to package instructions if you're not making your own. If you are making your own, you should be making it with uh, duck yolks and shrimp roe, um, if you can. Um, again, just to double down on those same ingredients. But portion-wise, we're looking for a snack. We're not looking for a full meal. It's kind of funny. I'm not actually totally sure why traditionally in Hong Kong wonton noodles are served more like um, more like a snack portion than a full meal. Let us know in the comments if you know, because I don't. There you go. We're just going to set this aside for now. Bring the water back up to a boil and the dumplings are going to go in. We're going to make a small delicate one, so we're just going to cook uh, three for now. One, two, three. The best way to know that these wontons are cooked is if they begin to float and the outside of the skin is translucent and wrinkly. This is probably going to take two minutes, two and a half minutes. There's a decent amount of shrimp and a decent amount of pork in there, so you really don't want to um, undercook them. While those dumplings are cooking, we're going to build seasoning. So just on the bottom of the bowl, like a tare from ramen, a little bit of soy sauce, sesame oil. Sometimes some places use lard. Shrimp roe on top. And this is quite special. These are yellow chives. Yellow chives are a little bit more delicate than Chinese chives. They're clean tasting, and they don't have a huge amount of like garlicky alien flavor. So they're really nice as a garnish. Um, and they're usually paired with seafood, which is perfect in this case. And this is the tradition, which is kind of funny. They put a spoon on top of that seasoning so that the noodles can perch over the top. Um, so it looks like there's more noodles than there actually is because it's just a snack portion. One of those traditions that I'm not 100% sure the origins of. Dumplings here, let's check if they're cooked. Again, I'm just gonna rinse them in cold water for five seconds to finish that gelatinization process. But see how hefty they are? Shrimp looks cooked, you can see the orange. You see that it's um, wrinkled up. The pork inside looks a little darker and it's cooked. That's good. Just in here for a couple seconds. Let that chill out. And then broth is gonna go over the top. On this side, classic Hong Kong style wontons with the noodles. Totally different eating context as a snack with a little bit of that yellow chive. And when you eat it, what's gonna happen is you're gonna dive in and then you're gonna mix all that seasoning on the bottom together with the beautiful broth. All that shrimp roe is gonna slowly rehydrate in that warm broth. And then you're gonna have a really delicate shrimpy, um, uh, uh, shrimpy, porky, uh, yellow chive um, wonton noodle. So here's the ritual. Mix it all together, make sure the seasoning is up. Taste the broth first. Ooh, delicate. The thing is like, actually funny thing, sesame oil always reminds me of instant noodles, but ah, so nice. Okay, and then the noodle, make sure it's cooked. <clears throat> Good. Proper. And then the wonton. That chew is so fantastic. You get that bounciness in the shrimp, and then you get the pork that's still got little bits and pieces. It's got that like sort of like earthy note, plus the natural sweetness from everything that's in that broth. A little bit of vegetal notes from the yellow chives and the bean sprouts. Such a balance, like an easy dish. Um, I'm actually quite impressed that this is done kind of in a home context. When you go to the really masterful wonton places in Hong Kong uh, and in Southern China, they're very, very um, um, specific about their ingredient choices. And that's where, that, that, that's the only big difference between this and that is the, the ingredient selection and then some of the technique in terms of building like a flavorful broth. 
Here are the northern and southern style wontons. If you want to make them, the recipe is on Food52. If you want to see me make anything else, send me a DM on Instagram or sound out in the comments below.